Hey everyone, welcome to the Wild and Uncut podcast brought to you by Ruger. I'm your host, Christy Titus. Thank you for tuning in. The line is going hot, so let's go full send on this episode. In a world where rugged and reliable matters, Ruger stands strong. Celebrating 75 years of American-made craftsmanship, Ruger continues to set the standard for excellence in firearms. From the iconic 1022 to the American rifle and beyond, each firearm embodies precision engineering and our deep-rooted traditions. Join us in honoring a legacy built on strength, innovation, and the American spirit. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. We're coming at you from Nashville at the Safari Club International Convention and I'm here with Lorraine Wolf who is the Director of Education and um, Humanitarian Services for SCI Foundation and we're so thankful that you're here with us and um, helping to kind of uh, share with our viewers and fellow conservationists out there the mission and the spirit behind uh, Sables and SEIF as, as a whole. Yeah, thanks for having me here today. Yeah, I'm really excited to be here. This is actually my first convention. Oh, welcome. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's pretty exciting. I'm enjoying myself. And I, like you said, I am the Director of Education and Humanitarian Services. And what that means is under the Safari Club International Foundation, they focus quite a bit, as most people are aware of, on conservation, yes. but as well on education and humanitarian services. And I always like to explain to people, because there tends to be some confusion, you have SCI. And SCI Foundation. S- Foundation. And we do collaborate on a lot yes. of different initiatives. And so if you want to think of it, that SCI is the organization that really advocates for hunters' rights you know, with government entities mm-hmm. worldwide. And then SCIF, we also partner with them to a degree on some, you know, initiatives, mm-hmm. but more specifically, we're focusing on conservation mm-hmm. and some of those wildlife management um, initiatives that are out there, as well as you know, working in other countries, particularly Africa, mm-hmm. on conservation. And then underneath there, we fall with the education efforts and also the humanitarian services. Well, last year in my home state of Wyoming, I met up with Maria Davidson and we did a bear spray initiative where we were yeah. educating people on how to use bear spray, how to be bear aware, and how to try to be bear safer in the backcountry of Wyoming and uh, that was an SCIF initiative and so um, you guys you know you're a lot of people think of SCI and SCIF as doing mostly global projects but you also have a lot of work that you do in our own backyards and in our communities and and you're definitely serving the communities um, around the country for sure. Yes exactly and so for example some of the education programs that we have in place now and they're fairly new to us we used to have an American Wildlife Leadership School that was uh-huh. based out of Wyoming. I've and, been to that school. Okay, so you... Yes, in Jackson Hole. Yes. yes. Uh-huh. So we made the decision to um, close the, those operations and we expanded sort of the... It's very similar the type of program, yeah. but then we're reaching out to the different states and going to them. So then mm-hmm. we can focus on... They get to choose whatever type of curriculum they want to focus yes. on. Sometimes it's aquatic, you know, education. Sometimes it's terrestrial. But then there's also a lot of in organizations that are interested in learn to hunt programs. Mm-hmm. So I'll give you an example. Recently, we partnered with New Mexico Game and Fish, and we are now starting to do learn to hunt programs for them. Uh, mostly small game, but we're going to be doing some big game in the fall. Okay. And those are great programs, and we really felt that would be a good partnership because their focus is on a lot of underrepresented or mm-hmm. underserved communities. Mm-hmm. They're free programs. Um, we just recently did one um, January 19th through the 21st. It was a women's duck hunt. It filled up within an hour. When I we can imagine. It. Yeah. yeah. And it was really successful. And what really the, what we... 
yes, it was great that they were able to harvest some ducks, mm -hmm. but really we were pleased with the outcome was they were able to form um, a community there. Yes. And then addition additionally, we had some great contractors there that were helping us. Mia Anstein was one of them. Love her. Um, we had uh, Todd Rogenkamp leads up that program. He works for SCIF, mm -hmm. and I've already received so much positive feedback from the women about how it was such a emotionally safe place. Mm -hmm. um, we had one woman there that, for example, she had spent like three different tours in Afghanistan and she had been fearful to go out yeah. in the in the outdoors anymore. Mm -hmm. And this was kind of like her first effort to do that and it was a great experience for her. So that's one of the programs. A lot of empowerment that it, comes A lot from of that. empowerment. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of empowerment. And, um, and we're having a quail hunt coming up after convention. Poor Todd, Raj and Camp. As soon as we wrap up here, he's going to have to probably fly out there pretty quickly to do that program. And then another program we are focusing on is more at the, for university students. Okay. Um, we have a university program that's more SCIF based, and we're going to pilot it with Auburn University. And working with those students to talk about the different and teach them about the different careers. Okay. And those students are primarily majoring in wildlife enterprise. Mm -hmm. And so we're, our goal is to sort of connect them with outfitters so they'll have that opportunity to network more. And then and maybe partnering with one of the local chapters there too in Alabama. Is there information online? So, mm -hmm. you know, for example, if you have a young adult in your family or if you yourself are a young adult and you want to get more involved in wildlife conservation or from that fundamental standpoint through curriculum-based programs, where, where do people go? So if you go to our website and you go under, um, it'll say programs, and listed under there, you're going to see your conservation programs okay. and then your education programs. And so they would find it in there. Okay. And then is there scholarships available for those programs or how does that work? There isn't scholarships available at this point, um, but what I can tell you is like some of our partnerships, we're really trying to partner a lot with state agencies yeah. because they lack the staff capacity to deliver these programs, but they obviously have quite a bit of funding. Mm -hmm. So they're able to offer a lot of these programs for free. Yeah. So that's really nice. Yeah. And that's great. That's great opportunity. And that's a great way for young adults um, that are coming into the job force or wanting to yeah. expand their career um, to really get those skill sets without having to take on um, a second job to, to kind of yeah. create yeah. extra revenue to pay for school. Exactly. And so the <laughs> one we are putting on, there's no cost to that. We're yeah. going to actually go to the university to do our, you know, our classes with them at the mm -hmm. university. The other thing we're doing with um, focusing on university students is we recently partnered with Delta Waterfowl yeah. and we're supporting their program. We've um, contributed some money towards mm -hmm. them and so they are a program that also works with universities. They're in a diff about 100 different universities mm -hmm. and so they have sort of a learn to hunt program that they focus more on wildlife management professionals. Because yeah. even though people are going into that field, they don't necessarily, we're seeing more and more that they haven't grown up, grown up hunting, yeah. right? So we're exposing them to that. Yeah, and a lot of these wildlife managers, I mean, you kind of think is wildlife management and wildlife biology is this grandiose um, community, but it's actually very small. It and is. most of the wildlife biologists and wildlife managers from these state agencies, they all kind of know each other. They and they're, they're all sharing information and, and they're all, you know, kind of working together on research projects and, and you know, habitat projects yeah. and and so it's actually very very small so um i always like to think of like if i if you're a young adult or you're somebody that's out there that wants to get involved or exchange your career or expand your career the proximity principle if you can yeah. be near people um and and collaborate with people that are doing what you want to be doing or get involved on the ground as a volunteer doing these things yeah. you're going to meet the people that are going to help you open doors to expand those career options and that is really important and you guys are really offering that yeah. opportunity for people yeah yeah, and I before I came to SCIF, I worked for Montana Fish and Wildlife. Yeah. And so you're you're absolutely correct. People envision that there's these hundreds of wildlife biologists, but it's actually Very fairly small. easy to network with them. And I yeah. always encouraged, you know, students that I worked with, yeah. do an internship, yeah. volunteer, just like yeah. you're saying, because you can yeah, really get those connections. Yeah, and if there's not one available in your home state, don't be afraid yeah. to l expand your uh, reach. You know, look at other states just because, you know, maybe an opportunity doesn't op up, open up for you in your home state, that there wouldn't be necessarily an opportunity in a neighboring state or, or you know, provide an opportunity for you to travel and yeah. experience something completely new. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 
And so, yeah, and then the other thing I really want to um, point out is we also partner with Sables. Mm -hmm. And so Sables is, um, if you want to think about it, they're the ones that really work towards supporting our education programs through fundraising. Yes. And so that's why here at the convention, we, they're putting on a luncheon. Mm -hmm. I'll be there. Yeah, luncheon. Yes. And it's, you know, coming aboard at SCIF, um, I've gotten to know a lot of them. And the one thing I can tell you that they're really pushing towards right now is creating this space for women who are already SCI members, mm -hmm. but it's supposed to be a space for them where they can not only, you know, participate in luncheons, yeah. but then there's also at the chapter level, they mm -hmm. have Sables chapter committees mm -hmm. and they're really pushing for a lot of the chapters to start, op you know, having one of these committees. Because mm -hmm. what we found is that those SCI chapters that do have that, they've created this, like I said, a space for women yeah. to a community really mm -hmm. and so that it's not just about hunting either they yeah. go out hunting together but they also have you know women in in sables but also in these chapters that don't yeah. hunt but they support hunting mm -hmm. and they do things like you know they have book clubs they go out and you know they create some sort of fun education program for youth mm -hmm. and so it's a great place for people to for particularly women it's not just open to women but yeah. we find that mostly it's women that's joining yeah. um, to be able to you know build that camaraderie mm -hmm. and have somebody that can be a mentor for them. Yeah, well now that I'm in my mid 40s, I have found that a lot of my friends are empty nesters or they have kids that are, you know, getting a lot older and, and they're looking for something to be enriching kind of for themselves. Yeah. Like a little bit, hey, what's my me time? Yeah. What am I interested in? And organizations like the Sables are a great way for women to get involved and get invigorated in the community yeah. and find other like-minded women yeah. and build uh, build the space that you're looking for. Where do, you know, how do you want to be spending your time, and how can you be serving your community and and being a good steward to you know wildlife conservation and yeah. and outreaching you know that next generation of hunter. Yeah, and what we found is that we were getting a lot more younger women that are mm -hmm. joining Sables too, um, especially at the chapter level. Mm -hmm. um, Kylie, who's in here in the booth, she's donating her time today. Uh, especially the Denver chapter has been really proactive yeah. in, you know, there's a lot of younger women. We have a lot, we have a communications task force involved in Sables and all of those women are under 30 years old. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. Yeah. Then that's a lot of fun because that's one of the, you know, one of the things that time and treasure as we get older and, you know, we retire or our kids move out, you know, we tend to have more time, more time. Yeah. Um, when you're in your 30s and you're a busy family and it's you've hard. got sports and you've got all these things going on with kids and it's a lot harder to carve out time. So it is really exciting to see that we are activating that younger crowd. And, yeah. and if you guys are out there watching or listening to this and you want to get involved, um, you know, it's a great way to do so. Like my my niece, my sister was bringing my niece to um, to events like this when she was like 10 years old. And so she was getting those volunteer hours in. She was helping her chapter. She was serving her banquets, you know, really helping kind of be that boots on the ground. Even as a small kid, it's a really great example to, to kind of show your kids on how we should be, you know, servants and stewards of the land and be giving back to community. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And then the other thing, too, is that what we have found is, like, especially with the younger women joining Sables, I mean, we have women that are going to college. Yeah. And what they're getting exposed through this mentorship and this, you know, these friendships they're making in Sables, sometimes with older women, but then they're going back to their communities and sort of passing it on. Yeah. So we have one younger woman, Meredith, who has gone back to her college and started, you know, many different clubs mm -hmm. around hunting. So mm -hmm. it's not that you have to necessarily have a lot of money yeah. and you don't have to donate a lot. There's lots of ways to give back. Yeah. And everybody has their unique strengths yeah. to an organization and in a lot of times you know there's people out there that have the ability and the financial means to, to donate funds and they might be lacking some volunteer time and volunteer help and that's really important to get boots on the ground and and um, boy the gift of time I always say is the yeah. most precious gift you can give because you can't buy it yeah. and once it's gone it's gone and so where you spend your time is really valuable and so yeah. the greatest gift you know that anybody can give is the gift of their time and so you know being and able to reach out with your time is so rewarding and it's so um, welcomed for organizations as well like SCI, SCIF and, yep. and Sables as well. Yep, we have a lot of, in fact our booth is primarily being manned by volunteers. We, yes, exactly. Convention. 
Yeah. I'm volunteering at the Women yeah. Go Hunt booth as well and in an hour a day. And it's not a tremendous amount of time, but it's enough to, you know, kind of extend a hand out there and welcome people into your community and let let people know that, you know, giving your time is really important because it is. It really matters. Yeah. And that's another thing when I was talking about how we at SCIF collaborate with SCI mm -hmm. on different initiatives. The Women Go Hunting is mm -hmm. another one. So we've yeah. been working together on that because they're great spot for women to be introduced to that mm -hmm. camaraderie but then we're the ones that are going to kind of come in afterwards hopefully and be able to yeah. offer some of those education programs for yeah. them. Yeah that's fantastic. So if ladies are out there and they want to maybe start a Sables chapter or a, a committee, how, what's the process for that? So the process is probably the easiest thing is once again on our website mm -hmm. you have the programs but then there's also a tab for Sables and then if you go into there there is something for members and committees. Mm -hmm. And so they can look in there and then there's paperwork you fill out. Probably the best starting point is to talk to your other members yeah. in your chapter mm -hmm. and get them excited about it. Mm -hmm. um, kind of bring it up to the president of that chapter that you, you feel like this is a great move for the chapter. Because yeah. it really does benefit the chapter as well because mm -hmm. they're, they're pretty good at starting to recruit yeah. other members, particularly women. And what I heard when I went to the chapter trainings is that they are looking for that. I mean, That's they're recognizing right. that they need to have this space for women mm -hmm. and they want them to be a part of the chapter That's right. and that they bring a lot of valuable um, skill sets. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're, they're, they were all reaching out to me pretty much asking, how do we do this? So mm -hmm. we're hoping in the next couple of years, we'll start to see more of them. Yeah, and I can attest to that because when I was in my 20s, I was a chapter president in Oregon and the ladies on our chapter, they that volunteered and yeah. gave time and support, they were powerhouses. And yeah. um, the ladies really know how to get stuff done. So they do. um, all the successful chapters that I know of have also really, even even ladies that are interested in hunting themselves, but really love to give back to conservation and community and support that relationship that perhaps a spouse or a parent has with the outdoors yeah. and hunting is really important. And there is almost 150 chapters of yeah. SCI nationwide. So the beauty of it is that that um, there's so many op opportunities that there should be a chapter near you yep. and then you can be that face you can be that voice that says hey I want to really reach out and connect with women I want to work with a CIF and Sables and try to just do a little bit more for conservation or excuse me education because you guys is big push is, is conservation education but just hey I want to be that that strong that front hold for conservation and education for our chapter yeah I'll give you an example there's a young woman in um, Michigan the Michigan chapter and Carly Rolls and she has started a program in the last two years that is really taking off on matching mentors and mentees mm. and her focus is primarily on women but yeah. she's also done it for other people yeah. in, their, in their chapter as well and it's really starting to just she has like 25 yeah. of them going now within mm -hmm. two years and and she just said you know I see this need and yes. I'm gonna bring it to the chapter mm -hmm. and she made it happen and that's what I always I, it's the best advice that you know you can give is if somebody sees a need be that person to fill it. Um, if you see a void, be that person that fills the void because there might be other people that are perhaps afraid or intimidated to start, but somebody has to take the initiative and gosh darn it, ladies, it might as well be us, yeah. right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like we might as well be the ones leading and, and moving forward with all of that yeah. and, and taking um, and serving our communities. Yeah. And one of the things that we're probably going to be focusing on is providing more women hunting yeah. opportunities. Um, and I think that, you know, it, it was telling that within an hour that we, you know, posted that registration for yeah. the Women Duck Hunt. It, it sold out. It just was filled. And so, you know, if anybody's interested in, you know, and I'm talking more from like they want to give if they're interested in maybe helping with those mm -hmm. or, you know, even if they want to contribute money towards those yeah. programs and if they have a need in their state and they're like, hey, I want to be a sponsor of that program. Yeah. We're more than open to it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's really important. I'm trying to do more women's outreach programs this year. Actually, I have three different women's events that I'm trying to organize just to really create and yeah. curate that, that sense of community and, yeah. and family with Good other ladies. And it's so important you it know, is. that we all stick together and work together. And whether you have the ability, like we were saying, to volunteer or donate financially or, you know, donate a craft or if you have a yeah. hobby or some yeah. kind of like side hustle business that you're really great at, um, these events are always looking for fantastic donations yeah. that we can use to kind of 
do that fundraising capability so that we have the funds to to do this on the ground work. Yeah, which exactly. is so important. Yeah. So the Sables website, SEIF Foundation website, they're two separate websites. No, they're they're same. Okay. So if you go to the foundation website, the SEIF website. Okay. Under there, you'll find information about our conservation department. It'll say programs, and then I'll have conservation and education. And when you, it also has Sables listed there too. Mm -hmm. But even when you go through education, you'll see a list that says SCIF education because okay. we do partner on some programs as well. Okay, fantastic. And for all of you out there watching, I do have a discount code. So I always want you to get the best deals possible. I want you to be an SCI member. So if you're not and you use code Titus23 at checkout, you're going to save 25%. And that's either on a new membership or you can upgrade your membership. And I really encourage all of you, join your Sables chapters if you have one locally, if you don't start one. <laughs> and then join your local chapters and national chapters as well. It's very important to be involved in your community and on your national membership, we're going to save you 25% with that code Titus23 and appreciate all the SEI is doing as first for hunters and, and what everything SEIF is doing and the foundation and Sables. And you guys, if you want to get involved, you want to learn more, go to the website. And I really appreciate everything you're doing and your volunteerism and um, in your voice speaking such um, incredible work into, into the world. Thank you. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, no, I appreciate you very okay. much, you guys. And tune in for more from, from uh, Sables and from SEIF Foundation. And I appreciate all of you for joining us for this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. Coming at you from the SEI convention in Nashville. Thank you all again. In the heart of the wilderness, every step counts. No matter where or what you're hunting, Onyx Hunt Elite has you covered in the U.S. and Canada with offline capability, land ownership, 3D mapping, and you can even access specialty courses, hunt research tools, and elite-specific features. No matter where you pursue the wild, adventure is assured when you upgrade to Elite for the ultimate hunting experience. Hey everybody, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Wild and Uncut podcast. We are at SCI National Convention in Nashville, and I'm here with my filling Wyoming resident, Miss Maria Davidson, who is the large carnivore program manager for SCI Foundation. And uh, that was a mouthful. It is a mouthful. It's kind of a long title. <laughs> but it's an important title. Well, that's why everybody just calls me the bear lady. It's shorter. Yeah. Well, that's better than the cougar. <laughs> what the? <laughs> okay, that's what not, I usually let's get. Let's not go there. People are like, oh, <laughs> cougar lady. Uh, but no, that's great. And um, we met here last year in passing and have like seriously become like, we're like the same person with our mule momisms and puppies. Yeah, we've, mules. We've got everything going. Horses. On. Yes, all, all of, of the above. All of the above. But you, last year we went and we did um, kind of a bear spray giveaway in Lander, where SCIF had provided bear spray canisters in training right, to right. residents of Wyoming because obviously in some of those bear areas it's it's important to be number one bear aware but also uh, proactive on preventing a bear attack. You know it, it's funny and you were there and saw some of those folks going through that training before we started doing that I didn't realize how many people had carried bear spray for years and, and had thought, no idea yeah, they how thought, to use it. Oh I'm good I have my bear spray. They couldn't get the safety off. No. They had no clue. Yeah. Yeah. And in some of our talking points, I'd say, you know, the time to learn this is, is not now. when the grizzly bear is it, charging that's you. That's exactly you, right. You kind of want to know this stuff ahead of time. That you, and there's an expiration date on it. it like, exactly. Bear spray does not last forever. It's not like you buy <laughs> once and hopefully you never have to use it. And, yeah, so there was a lot that went on to that. And it was really interesting, you know, it's it's... We had the, the robo bear out there and the charging simulation. You should have saw, like, this is a fake bear. There was a lot of people that were, like, really almost, like, panic mode over the robo oh, yeah. bear. So it was really good, I felt like, trying to create and establish some muscle memory. So if, heaven forbid, they actually had to use their bear spray, they were a lot more prepared on the steps and process, how to remove the safety device and exactly, where to spray. Because yeah. a lot of people it, want to spray up. Yep, and then the yep. bear can tuck their head and get under the under the um, that fog. That, that, yeah, yeah, that, that fog that comes down. out. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was 
the now infamous robo bear, people are talking about it all over the place. Creating that time pressure for people yeah. is obviously critical because yeah. you saw what it did to it. people fumbled around. They didn't know what to do. There was yeah. screaming. There was yelling. There was dropping of the bear spray cans. Yes. And I think the takeaway for me was it, it left people realizing, oh, no, yeah. I need to practice. Mm -hmm. I need to practice. And yeah. I'm like, yeah, you need to practice because you obviously are going to need some practice to be able to be proficient yeah. at this. Just like with a firearm. I oh, mean, yeah. It's the same thing. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I don't go hunting without practicing with my firearm. So why why go in the backcountry? I mean, that is like literally your life is dependent on that bear spray. And you only have seconds. Yeah. You don't have a lot of time. Yeah. You know, you really, really don't have a lot of time. So you blink and your, your and they're time on is you. over. And they're yeah. on you. So yeah. you, you need to have it out and or you need to be able to access it readily. Yeah. And that muscle memory, like you said, is is so cr incredibly important and people and you know you saw that they were coming over and getting our empty cans of inert so that they could practice which yeah. I, I thought was really good at mm -hmm. least they know what they don't know yeah which is a huge part of learning yeah. at least for me mm -hmm. And that's what we were practicing with was the inert bear spray. So, it, right. I mean, it has the propellant. Everything comes out. It has that full effect. It's just none of us were actually getting bear sprayed. <laughs> so that was really handy. Um, you don't want to practice <laughs> with full, no. like, propellant no. bear spray at home. Like, no. that is, you do not want to do that. You no. will really be. Don't try that at do home. Do not do that at home. Only do it with inert bear spray. Um, and it was a great training. And that really kind of kicked off some of our friendship and then, obviously, some of the relationship that I I have with SCIF and the work you guys are doing in Wyoming and you are doing the, the bear biology community as you put it is so small it the, seems like all the bear biologists they all know each other most of the wildlife biology is from different state agencies all seem to know each other you guys are all collectively working together you're sharing information on habitat species programs right there's so much going methodology, on methodology yes. data collection all of that kind of stuff and of course just like everything else other professional groups we meet annually and and regionally so we know what the others are doing so mm -hmm. you don't have to reinvent the wheel it's a great place to be plugged in so that you can really take your programs forward mm -hmm. with the help of the collective mind you yeah. know the collective hive because that's that's where the knowledge from others can help help us in Wyoming or the Yukon where we're doing a program up there. It's, it's just a great place to cut corners so you don't have to, one, reinvent the wheel, don't make the mistakes that other people have already made yeah. because I've, I've made enough of my own. Mm. <laughs> you know, you're right. It's a, it's a small world. It is small. And you guys had, you know, a couple of win, uh, what was it, two years ago or last year was it, where um, there were some people that had sued in Wyoming and Idaho trying to eliminate um, the ability for hunters to use bait for bears, uh, black bears, and saying that we were, we were going to potentially put some of these uh, grizzly bears at, at risk of being accidentally harvested. And um, our uh, SCI and SEIF's attorneys went in and fought that case and said, hey, no, this is actually the opposite. This is an opportunity for hunters to really observe and not only be species specific, but actually have a better opportunity to identify age and gender. Because um, bears are such difficult animals. Black bears, especially, are very Absolutely. difficult animals to, to uh. establish gender um, with their little fuzzy bums and whatnot and parts. So it's, it is difficult where baiting really helps. It, it certainly allows, you're right, that selective harvest. Yeah. It gives you the time to make those decisions where if you just are spot and stalk and you just don't have the luxury of yeah. that kind of time to really discern, yeah. you know, or am I looking at a male? Am I looking at a female? Yeah. Is it an adult? You know, that kind of stuff. So baiting gets really a bad rap. It does get you a know, horrible rap. It gets a bad rap. You know, I think for a lot of reasons in the Far East where you see some of that baiting, where you, and, and that's where some of that came from. They saw people bringing out chocolates and candy and things yeah. like that and, and automatically trying to make it a negative thing, yeah. which it just isn't necessarily no. always a negative thing. No. Baiting is not in and of itself bad. No. You know, for sure. It allows for a, a lot of... I think, better harvest overall population yeah. structure-wise. But speaking of hunting, we've had some awesome news from Louisiana yeah. in the last few months. So, you know, you, you know, I retired from um, Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, was there my entire career where we did all of the bear work and we delisted the Louisiana black bear in 2016. And we just recently won the lawsuit when, when 
animal rights organizations wanted to relist the Louisiana black bear mm -hmm. that judge ruled this week. So we're celebrating in Nashville this week. Win. And on top of which, the department has proposed their first bear harvest in decades wow. this year for Louisiana. That's so fantastic. the bear harvest is proposed for December 2024. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be super big stuff. I'm so fired up. I've just worked my entire career towards that goal. Mm -hmm. It's just amazing. It gives me goosebumps. Well, and it just goes to show, you know, hunters are truly wanting science-based wildlife management. And and we're working not only to ensure a strong future for uh, even our predator species, um, but also sound management. So with that, that you know, we have to have one and the other. We can't just have one or the other. And you guys are really lobbying for that and working for that and, and trying to make sure that we can harvest an appropriate number of bears. You know, Wyoming does a really great job um, in different units. Um, they're based off of uh, gender quotas so if a certain amount of females are harvested in one zone they'll actually shut down the whole um the whole hunting season for that just trying to ensure that we don't you know diminish our bear numbers so is louisiana going to have a similar management strategy or how is that going to be implemented they they did do that so our, the database in louisiana is so deep it goes all the way back to 2006 so they've got a really good handle mm -hmm. of population density and abundance, mm -hmm. including gender-specific mm -hmm. density and abundance. So it allowed them to provide tags based on the, B the BMA, the bear mm -hmm. management area, and how many females could be harvested from each mm -hmm. without affecting the sustainability. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point, once you have the level of data you need, it truly is just math. Yeah. You know, it's not super, super hard. Sometimes structure, hunt structure can be a little bit tricky depending upon what you're trying to accomplish. But, you know, once you have the data necessary, you can really tailor your harvest around what your, your population goals mm -hmm. are, which is super important. Mm -hmm. You know, bears are a species that I think can be difficult neighbors. They're not always easy to, to live with. They don't mm -hmm. always work and play well with mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. So it's super important to have sustainable bear populations yeah. in suitable habitat. But to allow the public, the local public, to decide, you know, outside of that suitable habitat in a, in a human-dominated landscape, you know, maybe it's not necessarily appropriate to have, yeah. you know, huge bear populations outside of, you know, specified geographical mm -hmm. areas. And that's okay. Yes. You know, we hear all the time um, antis wanting to say, well, they're not in their historic range. Well, that's true. Mm -hmm. But their historic range doesn't look the same either. No, it doesn't. You know, it Man is, has his, transformed that exactly. landscape. Exactly. Their historic range is no longer suitable habitat mm -hmm. because there's so many people there. Yes. You know, so it's it's okay to say we want, you know, a, a bear population here in sustainable numbers, but outside of there, maybe not so much. Mm -hmm. So, you know, going into those processes, you know, going through a public input process like all of the state agencies mm -hmm. do and making those decisions about, you know, what those BMAs look like, you can base your harvest on that, mm -hmm. and it works really well. You know, mm -hmm. it's you just don't see hunted populations going into decline because they are so managed mm -hmm. by the state fish and game agency they can they can liberalize the harvest or tighten it up mm -hmm. based upon what they're seeing in their data yeah the on the ground work and then this is you know this is where SCI comes in SCI foundation comes in also um, is you guys you know with your position you're on the ground ensuring that SCIF has a voice in these conversations and that's one of the reasons why you know everybody should be a member of our organization is because they're bringing on professionals like yourself to make sure that the hunter's voice is is heard and that also these decisions are being made made that benefit the wildlife but also benefits the people that live with them oh absolutely you know the the world is ruled by those who show up so if yeah. you want to have a seat at the table if you want to be take part in those discussions then you're going to need to bring your checkbook and your wallet and say you know what i'm willing to contribute towards these programs and projects mm -hmm. to collect the data mm -hmm. you know that way there's always this rift between um, hunters that, that believe one way and then antis believe the other way. The state fish and game agency mm -hmm. is, is right in the middle. You know what, if you have buy-in from the beginning, you know, pe you have people that are contributing to the research projects and yeah. we've got somebody like myself on board that can help, you know, comply with the different, you know, things that are mm -hmm. in that area, whatever it might be, coordinate the projects. 
then you get buy-in from your whole hunting yeah. public. It's like, wait a minute, we, you know, we've participated in this, therefore we believe in those population numbers. And once that happens, they're willing to liberalize the harvest, control the harvest, mm-hmm. whatever the case may be. You know, but getting that buy-in from the general public is really what you need. There are a lot of Americans that understand the value of hunting, but we all know that right now, national support of hunting is extremely volatile. It seems that with every passing day, our voice is diminished and the court of public opinion is not effectively hearing our side. We need advocates working on our behalf in Washington, D.C. to defend our freedom to hunt. And thankfully, when we need it the most, we have that advocate in Safari Club International. SCI's world headquarters are located in Washington, D.C., just blocks from the United States Capitol, which means that SCI is on the ground with our congressional leaders and federal agencies on our behalf, on behalf of the hunting community. SCI has an active political presence in all 50 states through their extensive chapter network and government affairs staff. If you have ever wondered why you should be a member of SCI, you shouldn't wonder anymore. Join us in the fight to defend hunting. Go to safariclub.org to learn more. You know, I'm going to give you an example. So Texas is looking at the status of mountain lions in Texas. And, of course, you have, you know, very strong opinions on both sides. Leave them a predator versus making them a game animal or even a protected species, Mm -hmm. whatever. So opinions are on both sides. Yes. Well, whatever TPW does has to be based on science. That's right. So what we advocate for is, you know what? guys let's get involved at the very beginning let's put our money where our mouth is Mm -hmm. contribute to this work so that we can get that baseline data we know what the density is we know what the abundance is because that in turn will then allow them to make those decisions without that information you can't make sound management decisions Mm -hmm. so it's important that that we are in on the the forefront of that and you then you get the buy-in from the hunting population the hunting Mm -hmm. public that says oh yeah i I'm, I'm aware of that. I'm familiar with that. It's springing stuff on people when they're not prepared for it, when, when they don't know, wait a minute, where's this information coming from? Mm-hmm. That's where I begin to see the distrust. Mm-hmm. You know, so right at the very beginning, we try to get in there on the ground floor and, and participate. Well, and the media tends to want to sensationalize some of this legislation as well. And you'll see it right. when it when it goes to advertisements for bear hunting bands and they show, you know, cub bears in a tree and acting like hunters are harvesting those. And I mean, it, it's a common knowledge in the hunting community that bears are not harvested in a family unit. I mean, if there is a sow that has cubs present, you know, those are not legal harvest. And so that is, that's something that we all know, but the person sitting on their couch, they may not know that. And the media might want to sensationalize this to make it look like we're going to orphan these bears. And that's really not the case. I mean, that goes with our sound biological management practices that we understand that you know these these cubs are vulnerable we want to ensure that they can survive and thrive and we don't harvest those sows and so we also have to try to educate the general public on okay what is reality what they're seeing on tv and what is complete sense sensationalized and, and false and and there's not really a huge voice out there saying oh no this is spending the money saying that this is not accurate information Right. And, you know, one of the things that, that I tend to see is, is kind of the actual facts really mm-hmm. don't let, you know, doesn't interfere with what they want to say. They, yeah. They, we don't, they, they don't let facts get in the way of their story. <laughs> no, no, not, yeah. not usually. And, you know, the, the truth is we're a bunch of scientists. We're a bunch of research geeks. So we have this belief. Speak for that, yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. That's me. We have this belief if we just tell the black and white truth, this, yeah. is, this is what it is, that it's going to convince people. And that's not, no. I think, what happens no. in today's society. And so, you know, that's just not what we went to school for. So it's, that, that's really hard for, I think, the, the biologist's point of view to get in there and really argue our case, mm-hmm. for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. But you're right. There's a huge population of people in the middle that are could be non-hunters mm-hmm. but they're not anti-hunters exactly you know and and surveys public attitude surveys mm-hmm. show 
that in general legal hunting mm -hmm. is supported. That's right. But when it begins to be skewed towards the little fluffy bear cub and they start using derogatory language and they have these huge campaigns, then you begin to skew public attitude mm -hmm. away from hunting. And, and, and that's a dangerous like thing. Trophy hunting versus selective harvest. And um, right. that, that right. you know, completely, I mean, it's basically the same thing uh, versus one has viewed with one perception and when you say selective harvest it's viewed with a different perception right and right that you know that vocabulary that is used on either side can sway someone's decision that is a non-hunter right and you know i guess uh, words words mean things That's words right. have words have a meaning words are, are powerful and you're exactly right it implies that all you want is this trophy That's that right. everything else is going to go to waste That's and right. and and that's just not true. No. We, w we had an internal discussion about this the other day, and I said, "Man, don't don't say people don't eat bears because in Tennessee, oh, bear oh, 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 a hundred percent." And you know, I see recipes coming out of you know some of those southeastern bear states where they do a lot of hunting. Tennessee mm -hmm. and and North Carolina, bear lard is coveted Very sought after it is it is absolutely coveted they mm -hmm. will they will break into your house and steal it it is very sought after it's a little bit like the stanley cup phenomenon going on right now exactly <laughs> e exactly yeah. you know you see whole like um pie recipes mm -hmm. where it's like oh my grand you know and my grandmother wouldn't make a pie if she didn't have bear lard, lard to make the crust and you know it it, it absolutely is yeah. a consumed game meat, for yeah. sure. Yeah, it is. And it's actually really delicious. Um, but beyond the beyond the consumption of bears, it just, you know, when we look at the model, we're managing with science, when we're trying to prevent human-wildlife conflicts, there's a lot going on. And bears are very curious, inquisitive animals, and they get very food-driven. And so, you know, trying to prevent, you know, and keep campsites safe and people safe. And they're very large and unpredictable animals. And having that management, having a practice in place, it, it puts a lot on the of the laps of the biologists, that's for sure. Oh, right, right. I mean, it is it is an, a, just a documented fact that mortality is truly the only way to control a bear population in terms of steering it towards the population goals that you might have mm -hmm. for that state or that mm -hmm. region. You know, that is a well-documented fact. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that I have seen anti-hunting organizations say publicly that they would rather spend more money, have their state spend more money on sharpshooters as opposed to letting hunters take those in illegal harvest mm -hmm. because they wouldn't enjoy it, which is, it's bizarre to me. It's like, it's fine for you to not mm -hmm. like hunting. That, that's your opinion, and that's fine. Yeah. Don't go. Mm -hmm. But there's no reason to spend more tax dollars you know, ha on sharpshooters to remove bears off of the landscape. And there's a lot of state agencies that are doing that, um, for example, like in Oregon, where they have banned hound hunting for mountain lions. So now they have government, quote unquote, government hunters that go in and harvest those animals, um, which is a cost to the state agency and the, and the taxpayers. And it also robs uh, the hunters have an opportunity to enjoy that harvest, appreciate the bounty, utilize the meat, um, utilize the entire animal instead of it being wasted. And um, I think... And, and it hurts the economy. I mean, hunt, economy. hunters do pour money That's into right. the economy. And, you know, those numbers, predators have to be managed that's right you know otherwise their population numbers can really get skewed in one direction or the other mm -hmm. and you know bears are a great example of that i was talking to somebody just the other day and I said, you know when when you go into a specific area and you do data collection on bears you know it's it's very similar to just a bucket of water mm -hmm. you know once it fills up and it's full doesn't matter how many times you go back and look at that bucket, it just still looks like a bucket full of water. Mm -hmm. What you don't see is that bucket has begun to overflow mm -hmm. and spread out into other areas. So, therefore, you know, the water is now yes. just going everywhere. But if all you're looking at it is the bucket, it still looks like the same bucket yeah. as last week and the week before and yeah. the week before and the week before. Mm -hmm. So if you have a harvest within that, ge that geographic area, you can control the amount of bears or water oh, spilling out. And, you know, that range expansion occurs. Mm -hmm. Bears are very willing to expand their range oh, yeah. outside their mom's home range. And that, that's what you see happening in many states right now, Louisiana being a good example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What other work are you are you guys focused on SCIF this year in, in your large carnivore program? 
Well, we are continuing our Yukon project, and so that's turning out to be really good. We went to the Ogilvy Mountain Range in 2023. In 2024, we're going to go to another geographical area, really trying to get a sample of density and abundance in several different areas mm -hmm. so that we can establish a region-wide abundance and density estimate for the Yukon. Mm -hmm. We are also expanding the Leopard Project. We're going to finish up in Botswana this okay. year, which is super exciting and then we're lining out in Mozambique for next year. Oh fantastic. Yeah there's a so lot much of work going on. There's a lot of work going on and this is a, again I and I say this already today but it's another reason why everybody should be a member of SCI and SEIF like because contributing to SCIF contributing to SCI helps us get the information we need to um, to fight for sound management principles to help pr protect the animals that need protected, but also do the work that we need to do to convey a message to the taxpayers and voters. That's, that's right. I mean, I think it takes a collective effort from all different segments, you know, the, the research work, the population work, human wildlife mm -hmm. conflict, advocacy, all of it working mm -hmm. together really, I think, is going to get us where we want to go. Mm -hmm. And we're going to start again with our bear spray giveaways. Mm -hmm. We are doing some bear spray training in Wyoming mm -hmm. starting, I believe, it's in March, yeah. right before the shed hunting yeah. season opens because we yeah. start seeing the conflicts then. So we're going to do those trainings again. You should come out. Yes. Uh, you guys, if you're in Wyoming, go on the SCIF yep. website. And uh, is it just a tab for that on where those distribution points are in Wyoming? It, we can put it on our website. It's also on Wyoming Game and Fish. Okay. You know, so we'll put all of those out, and I think our press release will go out next week or the week after. It's going to be in Dubois and Lander and Jackson. Okay, so if you're a Wyoming resident, keep your eyes out for mm -hmm. that on the Wyoming Game and Fish website. Get that information. Attend one of those trainings if you mm -hmm. can. Go there, pick up some bear spray to take home. And if you can't make a training, I encourage all of you, you know, make sure that your bear spray um, is not expired <laughs> and that you know how to work uh, at least the safety mechanism on the spray canister do not spray yourself with that uh, get an inert or anybody can. else <laughs> get an inert can practice with an inert can before you head into the back country this is so so important on these states that have these big these big bears to protect yourself and be aware and trained and um, understand some avoidance behaviors that will help you as well um, when you put yourself in the field where these bears are living. And um, Maria, I really appreciate you coming. Thanks. I did. I'm, I'm so glad to see you again. It's been I so know. much fun. I know. I can't wait to get back to Wyoming well, and go riding. We're we got some mule stuff going on this year. We're so yeah. excited about. So I know, it's fun. You guys stay tuned. Um, get online. Get to my um my go to my website. I've got a discount tab on my website pursuethewild.com. I want to make sure that you guys are not only SCI members but that you also save a little bit of money. So I've got a discount code. You guys can click through. It's Titus twenty three along with some of my other partner discounts. And I. I'm, Appreciate all of you joining us at this year's uh, SCI convention in Nashville. And until next time, Miss Maria. Thank we'll you. See you soon. Thank you. When conditions get tough on a mountain hunt, your gear must be tougher. Making every opportunity count means selecting equipment that will not fail. Any condition, anywhere. Hornady Outfitter ammunition is designed to perform. Available in a wide range of cartridges from 243 to 375 Ruger. When you're looking for a hard hitting, deep penetrating bullet and cartridge that performs in the most rugged environments, look no further than Hornady Outfitter ammunition. Thank you for listening to the Wild and Uncut podcast. If you would like to hear more, be sure to subscribe to my Pursue the Wild digital series on YouTube and follow me at Christy Titus on Facebook and Instagram.